Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Christ Church. Thanks for joining us online today. We're just glad you're here. Glad that we get to be together and to worship and to praise. As if you read the Psalms, the Psalms are just full of encouragement to us to praise God, to praise Him in all things, and to just praise Him because He's good. And He is a good God. So today, as we worship and as we gather, we just want to encourage you that God is good, He's with us. And we just want to praise Him today. So I hope you'll join us as we do that. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God is always up to something good. When I'm in the roughest water, I won't go under, I won't drown. And when I'm in over my head, I know that you won't let me down. And when I'm broken and down to nothing, I know that you are always up to something good. I know that you are always up to something good. You make a way, whatever it takes, there's nothing your love won't endure. I know that you are always up to something good. Even through the deepest valley, you go before me, you are here. And for I know you'll never leave me, your love surrounds me, I won't fear. And when I'm broken and down to nothing, I know that you are always up to something good I know that you are always up to something good or you make the way whatever it takes there's nothing your love won't endure I know that you are always up to something good Through the darkest night, you are on my side. You are always faithful. Through my fear and doubt, you will lead me out. You are always able. Through the darkest night, you are on my side. You are always faithful. Through my fear and doubt, you will lead me out. I know you are always able You are faithful I know that you are always up to something good I know that you are always up to something good You'll make a way, God For you make the way, whatever it takes, there's nothing your love won't endure. I know that 
know that you are always up to something good. You'll make a way, whatever it takes. There's nothing you love won't endure. I know that you are always up to something good. One at the ring, God and God alone. One cross, one grace, one name that saves. All praise to you belong. All praise to you belong. We lift you high. God and God alone, your name be loud, loud. Any other song you are forever seated on your throne. You are forever God and God alone. Who else can watch our sin away? God and God alone. Who else can raise us from the grave? All praise to you belong. Jesus, all praise to you belong. We lift you high. Separate us from this amazing love. What could say it's greater? And our God, every knee will bow down. Every knee will bow down. Yes, what could separate us from this amazing love? What could say it's greater? Our God, every knee will bow down. Every knee will bow down. We lift you high, high. God and God alone, your name be loud, loud. And any other song you are forever seated on your throne we lift you high high God and God alone your name be loud loud any other song you are forever seated on your throne you are forever How great is our God, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Come on, sing it again, how great, oh how great our God, oh sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. He's the name
He's worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. He's the name above all names. He's worthy of all How great is our God, and it will save my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou Savior God to me. How great Thou art. How great Thou art. How great Thou art. How great Archaeologists digging in the remains of a school for imperial pages in Rome found a picture dating from the 3rd century. It showed a boy standing with his hand raised worshiping a figure on a cross. The figure looked like a man, but he had the head of a donkey. Scrawled in the writing of a young person are the words, Alexamenos worships his God. Nearby, however, is a second inscription, Alexamenos is faithful. Apparently a young man who was a Christian was being mocked by his schoolmates for his faithful witness, but he was not ashamed. He was faithful. So what about today? What, what are we supposed to do today when we are mocked? Just this week, Tim Tebow was censored on Twitter for making the outrageous comment that Christians should remain faithful even in difficult times. Where do we turn these days? It's sort of like putting a kid in a round room and then telling him to stand in a corner. It's confusing. It's confusing the way we feel as we try to determine the best way as Christians to interact with our society and our culture. After all, society and culture don't seem to be improving and they sure seem to be more and more antagonistic toward people of faith. If anything, we're all scratching our heads and wondering what went wrong. Why are people so divided? Why is there so much anger? What's happened to the rule of law? And then there's the church. Church attendance is in decline. It was declining before the virus hit, and experts are saying the attendance will never come back to what it was in pre-virus days. Many Christians already more resemble the world than the church for which Jesus died. We miss the old days when church was the center of the community, when it was central to existence, and our churches were full. No matter our age, we all remember when days were better. So what are we to do? When faced with threat from the world and the ruler of this world, our first inclination is often to separate ourselves. No, in our culture, we are not yet being burned at the stake, but we do feel scorned by the media and the social influencers. In many places, it is even against the law to take a biblical stand on an issue. And where it is not against the law, it is certainly against prevailing opinion and therefore incurs the wrath of our fellow citizens. So safety says separate. We must separate. We must close ranks. It's sort of the whole concept of jumping into bed and pulling the covers up over our heads. Or at least cut off contact with the world as much as possible and stay within the confines of our church relationships and our church campuses. Early monastic movements tried separation. 
They built abbeys and monasteries and then they would wall them in as if they were fortresses. Many claimed an escape from the world enabled a more concentrated time of prayer and a time of study. But I wonder if the real reason that they separated was fear. Now, of course, it didn't work. As the monasteries and abbeys became more and more wealthy, they were attacked and overrun by various invaders. Then in the UK, at least, Henry VIII, for his own personal reasons, closed them down and destroyed their property. Obviously, the world doesn't take too kindly to those who would separate. And the honest truth is, we don't either. We don't like those who separate, even when they separate for religious reasons. You think about people of other faiths. When they take over cities and towns and then seek to impose their own beliefs and their own system of laws, we protest. I suppose we shouldn't be too surprised when others begin protesting about us. But maybe we haven't consciously separated. Maybe it's more of a natural, normal thing to do. Maybe it's just become the standard behavior for people of faith. Well, I get it. I certainly understand it. My best friends are in the church. I am most comfortable with church people. I prefer to hang out with Christians. Regardless, I don't think separation is the answer. I suppose if we didn't passively separate, then the alternative would be to become activists. The moral majority of the 70s and 80s tried that. Christians thought that the best response to the culture was to organize and to influence the elections. Well, that didn't work out so very well. Trying to force Christian beliefs and morality on a secular society is never, ever welcomed. People seldom take well to anything that feels forced. You just look at the reaction that we have in our culture today to wearing a mask. Some agree, some disagree, but nobody wants to be told what to do. And yet there is some truth to believing that God's will for us truly is His will for all people. We don't believe there are separate playbooks that God has provided for us, and yet Scripture does speak differently to those in the church as opposed to those outside. From those inside, Scripture says significantly more is expected. Still, ranting on social media against heathens and their behavior rarely brings anyone into the kingdom of God. Imposing our will or our own opinions on others is about as effective as others trying to impose their will or opinions on us. So into this dilemma comes 1 Peter. One of the first Christian documents reflecting on the problem of the relationship between the church and the state. Better put, between the church and the state of things in that time. Much of what Peter discusses is not the issue of the Roman state and its impact upon believers. Rather, it is what new Christians are experiencing at the hands of fellow citizens. Maybe you've had such experiences. I know that I have, though. They have been relatively minor. It's like my neighborhood friends, people that we know up and down our streets, decide to all get together and go out for dinner and a little bit of partying. And time and time again, we have figured out they don't really want the pastor sharing in the ordeal. Or the comments I have heard about my morality from those people who in no way share it. But I wouldn't say I have actually had to suffer for my faith. Not like some that I have met from other countries, like those in Cuba, those in Eastern Europe, where I have met doctors who have given up their status as doctors in order to follow Jesus. Or the professors who lost their teaching positions when they accepted Christ. Or those in Muslim countries who found themselves abandoned by their own families and even threatened with death when they chose to follow Jesus. While 1 Peter speaks to all who are following Christ, our primary concern is our own situation. What's going on today in our culture, in our country, in our society? What we are experiencing now and what may come in the days ahead. So today I want to begin at the end and summarize Peter's teachings. Next week when we come together, we will break down the letter into more applicable detail. Essentially, 1 Peter was written to encourage Christians in Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. 
to encourage them and remind them to maintain their confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter sought to challenge and strengthen believers to stand against this onslaught of persecution that was being leveled at them. He also desired to reinforce the glorious truth that the believer is only a stranger, somewhat of an alien in his, this world. Peter sensed that the message of holiness and dedication was especially needed during these intense periods of persecution. For there was a strong temptation to return to the world in order for the believers to maintain their property or to save their own lives. Peter was warning against a turn. He was warning against a turnabout where people would go back into their old way of living after they had come to Christ. So Peter makes a bold attempt to renew hope and to help them find meaning in their suffering and to urge them to stay together, to stay together as the church in mutual support of one another. As he addresses the issue of how believers function in a non-believing culture and yet relate to that culture in such ways as will gain favorable report and new converts, bring new converts to the faith, Peter is going to teach us about authenticity. I say that he is going to teach us because though many years have passed since the first century, our issues as Christians are still very much similar to those that received this letter originally. As long as there is sin in this world, there is going to be tension between people who follow Jesus and the culture in which they live. If that is not the case, then the church has a completely different problem that we'll address on a different day. For as long as there is sin in this world, we will be surrounded by a society that has the potential for making our lives miserable. And so we will be reminded that we are pilgrims, that we are exiles and aliens in this world. But in the household of God, we are family. Now a quick read of 1 Peter might tempt us to think the answer to our dilemma is clearly live holy, be good citizens, participate in society as best you can, endure suffering, and whatever the case, don't make any waves. But this is surely far too simplistic. And I know a few Christians who adopt such a quiet stance over and against society. Surely this formula alone will not do. Good. Good. There is nothing more frustrating than to share with someone a troubling and difficult situation that you are encountering and then to receive some kind of simplistic response. It's like being in the midst of marriage problems and speaking with a friend who responds and says, you know, you just need to dump her and move on to a new model. What Peter reveals is in no way simplistic. He sees the issue. He has taken this issue to heart. Peter cares about the church. He has prayed for insight from God. He delivers to those who receive this letter then a carefully composed response flowing from the very throne of the Father. Essentially, his response can be categorized into three separate features. First, he's going to talk about salvation. Peter wants all Christians to know how significant is the salvation we have received through the grace of our God. Peter uses a host of words to describe what has happened to those of us who have entered into this family of God. He says we have been sprinkled with blood. A great sacrifice has ensued. We have been ransomed. A great price has been paid. We have been purified. A great change has already occurred. We have tasted God. We have been healed. We have been presented before our Creator Himself. We have come into this life changing and lasting relationship through a new birth. A life-changing and a long-lasting, forever-lasting relationship. Because we are born again. Born into the family of God, we have an inheritance. We have a blessing. Not just any inheritance, not just any blessing, but one that is eternal and greater than anything this world has to offer or anything that we already possess in this world that we might lose. So Peter praises God for our hope, a hope that is both present but also is a hope for the future. And he emphasizes a final salvation that will be ushered in upon the return of Jesus. 
He writes in chapter 5, God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. Peter's next topic will be the church. Peter sees the church as the new chosen people of God, displacing or maybe replacing Israel in God's favor. He says the church is living stones. It's a spiritual house. It's a holy priesthood. It's a people who belong directly to God, a people of God who have received mercy from him. The purpose in his discussion of the church is to help believers know and understand that they are part of a new family. It is a family of brothers and sisters who love and care for them, a family who sticks together, a family who supports one another when the world casts aspersions. The dominant image of the church in 1 Peter is the family of God. Even the directions for specific groups of people are arranged around this family structure. God is the Father who gives birth to His children, who in turn form a brotherhood that practices brotherly love. Back in the day, we used to sing a chorus at camp. The chorus went this way, God is my Father, Jesus is my brother, and the blessed Holy Spirit is my guide. The devil's no relation, for I'm a new creation. I'm a member of the family in the sky. Well, that is exactly what Peter is communicating. And especially for those in first century Asia Minor, these words meant so much. These were people who were displaced. They were outcasts. Essentially, they were homeless. But in the church, they found social acceptance and spiritual nurture. They found a place that they could call home. Finally, Peter will teach of the Christian life. The Christian life is what naturally follows new birth. This is what is expected of anyone who has taken advantage of this salvation that has been offered by God. It involves practicing hope. It involves a commitment, an ongoing commitment to holiness. It demands a respect by God. It is evidenced by love. It is evidenced by growth. Because of salvation, believers pursue these virtues. It's just expected. If you have been saved, you automatically begin pursuing these virtues. But it's a choice you still have to make. These are not optional virtues. They are expected virtues. They are the natural response to God's love and to God's grace. For God to enter into a relationship with Him and then to continue living as you have done previously... To live as the world is absolutely unthinkable. Even in the midst of persecution, it is unthinkable. We have all heard the old adage, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Well, I have found that when the going gets tough, I look for another path that isn't so tough. The believers in Asia Minor were foreigners who had embraced a new faith. The practice of that faith stood in stark opposition to the local culture. It was misunderstood. It was a faith that was certainly not appreciated. For those early Christians, the going had gotten really, really tough. And for Peter, nothing would be worse for those brothers and sisters than to retreat back into their old way of living even if it seemed to be the easier or even the easiest option for them. Peter knew well that as they maintained their faith in Jesus Christ, there would be suffering. Even Jesus suffered unjustly. So he addresses a response to suffering that emphasizes a perspective of keeping focused on what is to come. God will judge. In God's time, in God's day, he will judge. And God will reward those who faithfully endure for his sake. Summing up, Peter essentially says, live together in unity and keep your eyes focused on the future. The future that God promises for his family. In essence, then, Peter's letter is an exhortation to holy endurance during suffering because we have experienced salvation from God. It is the greatest reward that we have been given at this point in our lives. It is the greatest response to this sin problem that we have. We have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, by our faith in the grace of God. 
And salvation will be given in fullness. When the day arrives, the complete picture of this salvation will happen when that day arrives and Jesus returns to take his family home. Since it was written and delivered, 1 Peter has been making an impact on the lives of Christ's disciples all over this world. When the emperor Valens threatened Eusebius with the confiscation of his goods and he threatened him with torture and banishment, he even threatened him with death. The courageous Christian replied, he needs not fear confiscation who has nothing to lose, nor banishment to whom heaven is his country nor torments when his body can be destroyed at one blow, nor death, which is the only way to set him at liberty from sin and sorrow. Eusebius got it. He understood, and my hope is that we can come to the same conclusions as together we study this beautiful letter of 1 Peter. Let's pray together. Father, the world around us is changing and we are facing new obstacles that have never presented themselves before. The church is not very popular and people who follow Jesus are often looked down upon. Persecution is coming in different forms for different people at different levels. But we sense there is trouble. And so Father, we need your care, we need your comfort, we need your guidance through these difficult days. We thank you for Peter and his letter to these churches. We thank you for their experiences from which we can learn. And we thank you that we can open up this letter in the weeks ahead, that we can truly understand your will for our lives during these difficult times as we seek to be your family, as we seek to be your church, as we seek to make a difference, as we seek to bring people to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I've already mentioned today, as Peter mentions, that Jesus Christ suffered. Jesus Christ suffered more than we can ever imagine. We can't even picture it, not just the physical suffering, but taking the sin of all mankind upon himself. This one who, Scripture says, was without sin, took our sin and paid the penalty for that sin before the Father. And so we invite you here at Christ Church, as we do each Sunday as we gather together, we invite you to gather with us now in a special way as you commune together with us, as we remember the sacrifice of Christ and the great meaning that has for our lives, the meaning that we can overcome the circumstances of this day, but we can also enter into that perfect existence with God forever. So we take the cup and remember that Christ's blood was shed. We take the bread and remember that his body was broken for us, that he gave up his life so that we would never have to give up our own. Thank you. Thank you for sharing in this time of communion that we call the Lord's Supper as we come around his table. Yes, I will lift you high in the Lord's valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Same God 
who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Is working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the Lord's valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will for all my days. Oh yes, I will. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. But nothing can stand against I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. But nothing can stand again. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy. When my heart is heavy all my days, oh yes, I will for all my days. Lord, yes, I will for all my days, oh yes, I will. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. 